Right. Well, thank you very much, Joanna, Helen, Chris, for having me here today. Um, what a brilliant day to do this, and thank you for joining me. And it's great to see uh, many of you attending and to see sort of the backgrounds that you have. It's always very useful, um, particularly with a topic like this. But I think uh, we're all involved in education somehow. So I think this is hopefully will be a very useful um, presentation and hopefully a great discussion afterwards. So um, I might get started then with a presentation. So let's see if you can see my screen. Great. So um, climate justice, what's it got to do with ELT? So yes, so the um, title of the presentation to, is actually a question. And there will be lots of questions throughout the presentation. And I would like to encourage everyone watching today to either grab a piece of paper or keep your phone handy um, to just keep some notes and then share your, your thoughts um, afterwards or just pop them in the chat when you're ready. I'd like this event to be more of a conversation, um, sort of a place for reflection so that we can find solutions that are applicable to different contexts. And now knowing that many of you here today come from different backgrounds as well and have different types of experiences working with climate justice. Um, so more than using a sort of a top-down approach, I think it's always productive to have a conversation and allow for, for debates to, to take place. So um, also, as you can see from the webinar description, this is quite ambitiously not only aimed at teachers, but also at school directors and other members of staff. And why is that? So a few months ago, I came across this post on social media and I thought, well, this is all very relevant, isn't it, uh, to the conversation. And though it's true, this post is aimed at marketers and people working in advertising and sales, it really struck me. And it made me think, well, yes, every job is a climate job. And it is true that teachers are the ones with a more visible role in the classroom and perhaps more than anyone else, but anyone working in education has agency. And this is sort of a, another slide with um, some, some sort of a, a, an interesting way of describing how um, it is important, how everybody has a role to play in a, in a company, in a business but in education particularly, it becomes more relevant. So, <clears throat> then, then I came across another, another article as I was preparing a blog. And um, more than ever nowadays, people, I think, especially after the pandemic, um, after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, started really thinking, reassessing their lifestyle and trying to align their lifestyles with their values, their work and values. And um, apparently, according to research nowadays, over 50% of employees wouldn't work for a company that lacks strong, strong commitments to social or environmental causes. And educational setting and language centers are not exempt, exempt from this rule. And we now know that according to research that 25% of a people in a community is needed. 25% of people in a community, we need 25% of people in a community to exercise social change. 25% of people to agree that something has to change and lead to that change. And this is key particularly when talking about education and the relevance of climate, just, climate justice to the ELT classroom and institutions in general. That's why I wanted to keep this presentation quite broad, but hopefully with enough substance, enough content that is applicable to different contexts and different roles within the ELT field. Um, 
this is hopefully a conversation that can extend in space and time and that we can re revisit from time to time. So let's define what climate justice is. We're all certainly quite familiar with climate change, um, but climate justice seems to be rather sort of elusive term, or at least for certain contexts. So um, in preparation for this webinar, I actually sent out a call asking for contributions, experiences working with climate justice in connection to the ELT field. Um, but I didn't get as many responses as I expected, perhaps because expectations at the time were quite high, but also we were quite close to the holidays. So people were, I think, busy with other things. Um, but as it happened, as I started redefining the question and I approached people directly, I found out that they were doing some work with climate justice, but they did not necessarily know that they were doing it. So what is climate justice? So climate justice, in its essence, acknowledges that climate change is not only an environmental problem, but also social and a political issue. So climate justice really lies at the intersection of these three dimensions. And so we're used to talking about climate change as an environmental problem. We can see the effect that it can have on the animals, land, etc. But when we talk about climate justice, the social and the political component have a very strong influence. And we cannot leave out the different layers that make up the scale of the global crisis. So I added a picture here that really shows the different aspects that make up the complexity of climate justice and the implications for people and for our students. So when we talk about climate justice, there are deeper layers that need to be decoded. And that is why um, we need to understand the whys and the hows um, of whole communities that are now suffering from displacement due to extreme weather. There has to be a deeper cause and effect understanding and the right frames to decode it. And so I'm going to bring here um, a famous um, cognitive scientist and linguist, George Lakoff, who um, really talks about frames. And he argues that we might very well still lack the cognitive frame to understand the magnitude of the environmental crisis. So what are frames? So frames are structures. They are relationships, they are systems, and thematic roles that are unconsciously stored in our brain. And they are activated as we speak. So if, for example, we talk about schools, then we bring the thematic roles, the teachers, the classroom, the students. They will be activated in our brains as we speak. So to understand something complex, we need to have the right system of frames in place. We need to know, or well, now we know that we need to recycle, we need to consume less, but why? We need to focus on the causes, the root of the problem, the, the how we got here. So another point that he makes is the focus on action. And I have an interesting quote here on screen, um, it says, well, all, all the concept of environmental action, what can we as individuals do? Use less energy, replace our light bulbs, drive less, walk more, ride bikes, recycle, eat organic, eat local, green our homes, buy green. All of this is fine and necessary, but the most important thing is missing, political action. To an enormous degree, governmental action outweighs and shapes individual action. When we think of the environment, we should be thinking of political involvement. But politics is not in the environment frame. And so, um, yes, this is another point on why we need to talk about climate justice in relation to ELT. We can help not only develop the necessary frames, but also incorporate that political element, that political action, the engagement, the involvement that is needed. And again, thinking about that 25% needed for social change to happen and the importance of political action. So there are many 
um, definitions and approaches to the term. So for, for the purposes of the presentation, I decided to focus on the six pillars for climate justice. But I think are quite helpful for the development of the presentation. So I won't go um, into all the pillars in detail, but we'll focus primarily on climate education and engagement and um, briefly discuss the rest. So first, we have a just transition, which really implies working towards a change that involves what I like to think that we can do from the arts and the humanities uh, towards a more equal world. Um, we can only think of, well, sometimes we often think that science and technology can provide a solution, but it can only be a partial solution. We still need the human response to the crisis. Then the second pillar focuses on the social, racial and environmental justice. And really what it does, this pillar acknowledges the deep connections between marginalized communities and the impact high CO2 emission countries have in their territory. And this is quite crucial. Uh, we have probably all come across the historical responsibility that some countries have, predominantly from the global, global north are having guilty of high carbon um, emissions and the impact these emissions have on less developed countries. And the very, very um, close to this is the, the third pillar. And at the core of the third pillar lies indigenous climate action. And indigenous peoples are most affected by climate change. And Kyle White, another prominent scholar working in this field, argues that climate change is a continuation of colonialism in that this previous experience can provide uh, indigenous peoples with the tools to face this new situation, which I find quite, quite shocking and very, very sad. And even in the, um, the latest issue of the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, the latest report has made explicit reference in its summary to how um, colonialism has had an impact on indigenous peoples and communities. So history plays a key role in unpacking the term and making meaningful connections. And this is another important aspect to consider to encourage in students the need to keep in mind the scale of the problem and the need for working across disciplines. I, I think this is quite crucial. It is important to make these connections early on to allow for critical thinking and ecological awareness. And then um, community resilience and adaptation really focuses on measuring the community's capacity to recover from a climate impact, such as a hurricane or a flood. It also focuses on the reduction of ongoing and intensifying negative aspects of climate change. Um, and looking at the models that are used and how often they reproduce unjust systems is critical for effective adaptive capacity. And we know now that there will be around 200 million people who will be displaced due to climate change by 2050. And this will unquestionably pose new challenges to the ELT classroom with more students having to learn English in often quite traumatic situations, as Gulan Katunic point out. So English language teachers have a key role in ensuring that students suffering from climate displacement adapt to their new community and the new environment. And then the fifth pillar, the natural climate solutions pillar, focuses on land management and access and more equal practices such as permaculture, agroforestry, forest restoration. So really thinking about ways in which land can be used in more equal ways. And then lastly, we have the sixth pillar, which refers to climate education and engagement. And this is a crucial dimension for us here today. This pillar simply emphasizes the, that examining the roots 
of the course will give us a better understanding of why we need to consume less, why we need to recycle, why we need to repurpose, reduce, rethink our lifestyle, particularly if we're living in a high um, CO2 emission country. And this bit really struck me. And it sort of summarizes what hopefully is one of the takeaways of this presentation. We need education, not only based on climate science, but also on the ways in which climate change is deeply intertwined with a range of other social, racial, and environmental issues that define our daily lived experiences. So of course, I'd like to hear your thoughts later, um, later on. So I think that working across together, across discipline to find solutions within our own context is needed for driving a positive change and actively encourage involvement both at an academic level, but more importantly, at a civic level. So encouraging students to develop these connections is perhaps one of the things we can focus on in the ELT classroom. We need new ways to understand the world and we need new tools. So what does this mean for ELT? What does this mean for teachers? Well, firstly, there are deep connections, unfortunately, between the inequalities people suffer from and the use of language, particularly the English language. And as we said earlier, there are deep connections um, of how Engl the English language use has been used in the past to promote often aspirational and unsustainable values. So I keep thinking about ELT as the umbrella term, but then of course we need to consider all the other distinctions. So for those of you working perhaps in the field of ESOL, English for speakers of other languages, um, with students who have actually suffered climate displacement, this topic would be extremely relevant and quite important to, to sort of develop and learn about it. And it would be very useful if you could all share your, re your experiences at the end of how you work with all these realities in the classroom. How is it possible to work with all these realities in the classroom? How do we do it? How can we take action at a teacher level? So one way of doing it, um, and this is an approach I, su I, I suggest it could be useful, is by developing eco-critical language awareness. And that is by focusing really on values of social justice and the incorporation of explicit conversations about power relationships and language. We can also acknowledge that these relationships impact broader ecosystems by bringing in an ecolinguistics perspective. And I'd like to encourage you to go back to the um, to the webinar library and check the language, language and ecology uh, webinar by Aaron Stevie, who talks about how specific patterns of language can reinforce um, environmentally harmful practices. And then, of course, we have framings, as we've said earlier, that can also promote positive discourses and stories. So in terms of um, eco-critical language awareness, it is really about exploring how power relationships and language can affect both the human and the non-human world. And in practice, an eco-CLA approach to English language education aims at identifying and promoting language use which contributes to ecological sustainability, justice and well-being. And this is, um, I draw from this paper written by um, Robert Paul and Marco Michael Hurtado, which is, um, I recommend you can have a look at it later. I'm sure um, Joanne and Helen can share the link with you. So there are five principles for eco-critical language awareness that can be applied to the ELT classroom. So the first one, eco-CLA presents learning as bound to the physical world and its many human and non-human animal inhabitants. So this is really acknowledging that the human culture divide is no longer productive. And I think in many contexts, this is, this is no longer a tradition. And again, this is an extremely unhelpful frame. 
we need to make it clear to our students that part of that failure to acknowledge that we're all so deeply connected to the land, to nature, is what brought us to this um, environmental crisis. And the second principle, eco-CLA promotes well-being and sustainability as common sense. So schools play a major role in development, developing students' worldviews and promoting values that then later on become the norm. And teachers have a role, have a very critical role in guiding students in identifying these damaging narratives and giving them the tools to challenge them. And then the third principle, eco-CLA promotes the development of ecological consciousness by engaging students in localized, sustainable thinking. So nothing works if it is imposed. We all need to feel involved and committed. And so engaging with students in a way that really invites them to reflect on their local sustainability issues, their communities and lived experiences, and how climate change is affecting them is the way to go. Again, working and engaging with the local community and thinking about the six pillars that I mentioned earlier and how solutions can come, can arise from these interactions and be more relevant to the students than working perhaps with instructional materials that have little to do with them. And then the fourth principle, eco-CLA advocates for students negatively affected by climate change, especially for students from marginalized communities. And I think this principle really touches on the relevance of exploring the intersection of social justice, environmental action and politi political engagement, highlighting the unsustainable practices exposing those power relationships that promote cultural and linguistic imperialism are one of the crucial elements for developing students' advocacy. And then the last one, pedagogical application of eco-CLA promotes language instruction that presents multiple English varieties as equal. And the premise here being that by teaching Englishes and plural and not, not capitalized, uh, it encourage, encourages students to develop diverse Anglophone active, um, identities and are less likely to incorporate unsustainable practices that are usually attached to um, historically standardized varieties. And again, here is an opportunity for teachers not to be part of the linguistic imperialism problem by incorporating other types of Englishes to their classroom. So there are a few examples in the paper that I mentioned, um, but I would like to draw your attention to um, just a couple of ideas you could perhaps try. So the first activity is around social media and um, choosing really a topic that is of environmental relevance but students are encouraged to localize it to their own community to make it relevant for themselves. So, um, which means really connecting the global with the local. And so um, you can create a social media portfolio by um, using different social media tools, platforms. So for example, you can work on advocacy on Instagram by creating a post that raises awareness or proposes a solution on the topic in 250 words plus an image. Uh, then you can use TikTok to introduce a problem and a solution. Um, you can also create a podcast, five minute podcast. You are the expert. One of the students is the expert on the topic and the call to action on Twitter um, that is related to, to the topic in question. So again, a question for you. Um, so I wonder if, if you've worked with climate justice before, if you've actually incorporated climate justice to your classroom, uh, what activities have you used in the past? And would you implement any of these activities in your classroom? What would you change? Um, I think this is also quite important to, to share. And then of course, there are many resources online and I'd like to draw your attention to the previous webinars. Um, there are some excellent activities that you can try. 
in take teaching outdoors and um, how to turn your eel your teaching materials green um so please have a look there at the green action elt library and then there are other uh there are a number of resources which are also free and that can be accessed um for example have a look at uh, the ideas for global citizen citizenship website they've developed a very useful guide uh, that really takes um, sort of a human rights based approach to climate justice. Um, the activities are not graded and are not necessarily aimed at ELT, but they can be a great source of inspiration, uh, particularly if you would like to sort of incorporate this approach with a strong focus on the UN's uh, sustainable development goals. And as always, be critical of what is available and then think about localizing it. And then, of course, we have uh, the British Council's Climate Action Connection Initiative. Um, again, lots of great resources there from lesson plans to forecasts and stories and webinars, which can be great to use. And the Oxfam website, which has plenty of guides and activities for students, which are aimed directly at, at climate justice. Um, so also great resources there. And yes, another resource, the ELT footprint website with lots of wonderful, wonderful activities and resources. Um, and of course, as I always say, please do get support from your school, your centers, your institutions, start a conversation. And um, yes, so another question for you. I wonder if you've come across any of these resources before and if if so, what was your experience working with them? And if you haven't, if you've worked with something uh, different, then uh, please feel free to share them. Right, so how can this benefit our students? How can working with climate justice be a benefit? So, um, these are some examples of why incorporating climate justice to, to the class as a topic is important, how it can benefit students. Uh, we talked earlier about the importance of involvement. So strengthening key skills such as leadership, communication and decision making. This is, um, this is crucial. This is crucial if you want to develop that political involvement in the students, that engagement, and also improving their confidence boosting their resilience, their well-being, making them feel confident and valued and engaged, um, also making their voices heard on issues that affect them and their communities is another crucial step leading to action. And then, of course, building empathy and respect, particularly if they are sharing the class with students who have experienced climate injustice firsthand. Another thing is managing eco-anxiety. We all know about climate change. We all know that we need to do something and that can be a bit overwhelming, especially for, for, for the younger generation. So this is another way in which we can teach them how to manage this, how to cope with this. And then working collaboratively across disciplines. I think I cannot emphasize this enough. It is important to work with others so there are many skills that can be gained. And of course, working across disciplines and making these connections that are not so straightforward is critical. It's important to develop that awareness, that level of awareness. And then of course, what other benefits can you think of? Can you identify any challenges? Um, we will go back to this question at the end and I'll, it'd be great if you can share your experience. Um, so now, as I said before, teachers are perhaps the more, the more visible face when it comes to English language teaching, but institutional support is crucial for truly supporting climate justice. So um, we, uh, we now know that this is quite a relevant thing and that we need to obviously understand the implications of what 
climate justice thus, or, or the reach of the scope of climate justice at an institutional level. So those, for those of you working at the language centers, center, for instance, I'd like to encourage you to think about your own institution and how you're currently supporting climate justice and what can be improved. And um, we know now that more than ever, companies in specific countries, particularly in the UK, um, are being sort of pressured to comply with certain standards regarding sustainability and show their green credentials, for instance, becoming net zero or becoming B Corp certified. So there is often a lot of emphasis on recycling, repurposing, reducing, but what other aspects can reduce inequality? So this is when we get into the field of corporate social responsibility. And that essentially means that the performance of a business in, is not only measured in terms of profit, but in how successfully it addresses social and environment, environmental impacts. So here are some um, areas to explore at an institutional level. Um, perhaps you might think of developing a sustainability policy, creating edible gardens and promoting healthy food habits and reducing food waste. Also thinking about um, energy use and how efficient you're using energy in your, in your buildings, your facilities. What can you reduce? Um, oops. And then organizing environmental action clubs and weekly campaigns, Transport Tuesdays, for example, weekly walks, I encourage students to share lifts, um, et cetera. I know that there's a webinar coming up about transport, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, and litter picking. And then obviously supporting community projects and engaging with purpose-led charities and organizations. And encouraging circularity, um, thinking about secondhand sales, for example, when it comes to uniforms, uh, box swaps, um, and then the, the, the crucial one, buying from ethical supply chains and supporting local suppliers. Then again, this really ties in with the idea of supporting the right projects and organizations. Um, and the same applies with sponsorship. The, I think that you really need to dive deep into the culture of those who are sponsoring you or those who you sponsor. Um, who are they? What do they believe in? Do the, those values align with your values? And be critical of greenwashing and indirect greenwashing. And then, of course, promoting a diverse work and hiring culture. So another question. So can you, can you imagine how these ideas can be implemented in your institution? Can you think of any challenges, any other ideas perhaps? And then coming to the end of the presentation, so to, to really to wrap up, um, so introducing climate change to the ELT classroom can help learners develop the necessary frames um, and skills that are needed to face this new challenging environment. Involvement is crucial for supporting climate justice and e enabling social change. And here I think about that 25% that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, leading towards social change and what can be done. And cross-disciplinarity is key for understanding the roots of climate change and also necessary for driving positive impact to the ELT community and the community in general. So work with your colleagues invite them to the classroom, uh, invite members of the communities to the classroom. We all have a role, we all have a responsibility. And just remember your job is a climate job. And institutional support. It is important for a consistent and coherent approach and for shaping, for really shaping a workplace culture that genuinely engages with climate justice, both at an academic and at a civic level. Um, don't be afraid to raise the conversation. If climate justice is important to your students, then it is important to you. It should matter to you and it should be important for your organization as well. And then obviously just keep the conversation going. Um, I think um, it is extremely important and crucial 
to have conversations at different levels with different people, different stakeholders. So please keep going. So thank you very much. Um, I'll leave my contact details on screen now. So please do reach out. Uh, I would love to hear from you and your experiences. So thank you for watching, for listening, for being here today. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions now. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. That was, wow, that was uh, really interesting.